This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. I'm Nate Potker. 6,343 million metric tons of greenhouse gases were emitted in the United States in 2022, according to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. These gases act like an atmospheric blanket, warming the conditions found on the planet. But what if you could capture some of those emissions and transform them into useful products? We are joined by Berju Gurkhan, professor of chemical and biomolecular engineering at Case Western Reserve University, who is developing new techniques to capture greenhouse gases with electrochemical processes. Professor Gurkhan, thank you for joining us today. Hello. So part of your work that brought that caught our attention here and why we're having this conversation today is, is that you're working with electrochemistry and capturing carbon. So I think we need to kind of get some of the basics on our way to exploring that topic. So what is electrochemistry? So electrochemistry refers to a chemical change, a reaction that occurs due to electric potential difference. So instead of pressurizing a system or heating it to supply energy to drive reactions, we can apply potential difference or inject electrons for reactions to occur, such as electrocatalysis. In the opposite case, when a potential difference occurs as a result of chemical reactions, then we can make use of this in energy storage. So you can think of electrochemistry as an incentive to, for reactions to happen. All right. So like a way of spurring it on through a specific technique, really. So the next one that I, I read a bit about is you're using a term called HBOC, hydrogen bonded organic complex liquids. What is this? Yes. Um, so I, I thought about how to differentiate, you know, what we work on, then, um, you know, some of the common solvents or liquids out there. So these solvents are composed of organic ions and molecules that act as hydrogen bond donors or acceptors, such as glycols. So they have um, typically high salt content, and they have these additional glycol-type molecules that just kind of keep things together because there are now columbic interactions, and then there's hydrogen bonding network, so we have hydrogen bonding interactions. And that way, these liquids present very low volatility and high thermal and electrochemical stability. So all of the traits that you would want in an environmentally friendly uh, solvent that could be an alternative to those volatile organic solvents that we use in many applications. However, some of the fundamental mechanisms are different, such as transport of species in these liquids that do not follow um, traditional theories, and that's what makes them complex. And we try to understand these complexities in these liquids because they are tailor tailorable for specific applications, meaning we can attach a functional moiety to the ions or purposely choose a functional hydrogen bond donor or acceptor that have chemical affinity to a target molecule, such as CO2, so that we can selectively capture it from air or emission sources. So HBOX are, um, you know, not, nothing mysterious, in fact. They are, um, you know, mixtures, and, um, but, but, the, but the nice thing is that they are tailorable for a specific application. And for our project, we actually tailor them for carbon capture. So uh, I guess, how do you tailor it for carbon capture? How can these HBOCs be used to capture carbon? And is it directly from, say, an air source? Or would you pour it? Like, I guess, how does it work after you've made it? Yeah, so carbon dioxide and acidic gas. So one way we can design solvents to incorporate you know, basic groups so that we can have acid-base type spontaneous reactions that can occur as a mechanism to carb uh, capture carbon. And uh, HBOX, uh, these are ideal solvents because, because we can further tune how strongly CO2 binds to the solvent by modulating the basicity and the uh, strength of hydrogen bonding network. Say, let's say if it's too strong, uh, the CO2 too strongly binds with our solvent, then it will be difficult to desorb the CO2 and regenerate the solvent. And if it's too weak, now we would not be able to capture enough. So depending on where we want to capture CO2 from, we can design them. So for instance, if we want to capture carbon dioxide directly from the air, we know that 
um, it is very, very low concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere. So we need to have really a high capacity materials or solvents um, that have a lot of binding sites and it, w- it will be easy to then uh, selectively absorb CO2. But if we are implementing carbon capture, let's say to um, capture carbon dioxide from emission sources, then the CO2 concentration is a little bit higher. And so we may not need as um, you know, strong bases in our solvents. So this is depending on the situation. Um, the nice thing with HBox is we can fine tune that binding ability. Okay, so I'm I'm thinking of I'm trying to picture it. I guess I'm I'm pretty visually minded, and I'm thinking of solvents in terms of like nail polish remover. What would you be making it into in this case to capture carbon? Like, are is it a liquid or would it be some sort of filter or something? I don't know. Uh, yes. So we can um, use the liquid directly. So, for example, if we spray it um, like a shower from a shower head. Right. Um, right. And so we would create little droplets of these liquids. Okay. And uh, this way we create a lot of surface area for gas to contact with our liquids. So this is one way of um, capturing carbon dioxide. And this is one of the most mature technologies out there, um, especially, um, you know, uh, c- capturing carbon dioxide from emission sources. Of course, you know, we cannot have rain <laughs> like that to, um, you know, capture carbon dioxide from air. So we can think about, um, you know, putting these liquids in some uh, over some structural supports, uh, structural frameworks, and we can, um, you know, pull air and force it to uh, go through and go through the surface of this, uh, you know, structural supports where we have our active liquids. So we can think about different ways. We can encapsulate these liquids and pack them in a column and just, um, you know, kind of have have air go through our column. Um, And as it passes through and it, you know, makes contact with our material, it will then selectively get absorbed. So there are different ways of implementing these liquids. What do you do with the carbon after it's been absorbed? A very good question. Uh, What do we do with the the captured carbon dioxide? So the traditional way of thinking is um, we're going to separate it from a dilute source and concentrate it. That way we we have, um, you know, high purity carbon dioxide and we can do other things with it. Um, We can, you know, sequester it. We can use, um, we can use it if we have really, really high purity CO2 to, you know, for acidic drinks like soda, uh, for food, or we can do, you know, uh, conversion to other fuels now that we have this carbon. One of the biggest challenges, though, is the cost of energy for solvent regeneration or more broadly the sorbent regeneration, whether it's a liquid or a solid. Um, after the liquid or the solid adsorber is saturated with carbon dioxide, we need to regenerate. And this way we can concentrate CO2 and reuse the solvent or the sorbent for continuously, um, you know, repeating this process. So while we learned how to increase CO2 capacity of materials by, you know, functionalizing them and so on, we're still working towards lowering the energy requirement for regeneration, especially in the context of decarbonization and adaptation of renewable energy sources. There is also the need of powering such capture processes with renewable energy sources so that we can implement carbon capture independently of additional infrastructure needs. Is that the biggest challenge with efficiently capturing CO2, putting it into the form that's usable and doing it in a cost-effective manner? (laughs) Right. Um, There are several challenges, but I would say Um, Regeneration is one of the bottlenecks uh, because it does require energy to kind of, you know, um, kind of clip that binding that you implemented by design, you know, how to get it now off of our material. And that requires typically a thermal energy input, right? And then the thermal energy comes in the form of steam and steam comes from fossil fuel burning and from power plants. So in the context of you know, renewable energy sources such as solar energy and using electricity, 
to do some of these, to drive some of these processes, um, you know, how, how do we engineer the, our materials or how do we engineer the process so that we can um, think about carbon capture as a modular process, as not part of a, you know, big infrastructure. Mm. So what is the biggest challenge, I guess, with scaling it to become that more infrastructure or more regularly used aspect? It's, you know, it's always hard to mimic what we achieve in the lab right. under well-defined conditions out in the world because there are increased variables such as changes in temperature, humidity, and other impurities that present side reactions. So aside from these variables for carbon capture specifically, we need to be able to process large volumes of gas, which require fast and efficient transport of CO2 to the reaction sites and similarly effective energy transport during regeneration. Therefore, we need to, en we need to be engineering these gas-liquid interfaces for carrying out such chemical transformations at scale and at speed. Awesome. Thank you. So you talked a little bit about how the resulting products could be used. And there's one term that I keep reading that I kind of don't have a clear definition of in my head, and that's the CO plus. So can you tell me a little bit just what that is? <laughs> yes. So um, this is where electrochemistry comes back into our discussion. Um, it's the prospect of direct utilization of, car uh, of the captured carbon dioxide. Whether carbon dioxide is chemisorbed or physisorbed by the solvent, if we can bypass the costly regeneration step and activate carbon dioxide for further reactions without separating or concentrating it with the use of renewable energy sources, such as electricity from solar energy, then the entire process becomes economically feasible in theory. As you can imagine, there are challenges here too, activating the carbon dioxide and producing other fuels at practical rates now become the technical limitations. Um, this is again where HBOX offers certain advantages as they can form structures at the electrode-electrolyte interface that lower the energetics of the electrochemical reaction. And if we understand how these structures form and how to further control them, we can modulate the product selectivity, for example, whether we selectively convert carbon dioxide to carbon monoxide or the plus, such as methanol and, and so on. So ideally, um, this process becomes more uh, incentivized as we convert carbon dioxide to higher value uh, chemicals or fuels. Carbon monoxide is what we envision, you know, carbon dioxide uh, conversion, electrochemical conversion. The first step we think involves uh, this carbon monoxide formation. And then from there on, if we have a way of keeping this intermediate on the surface of, let's say, a solid catalyst, um, let's say, facilitated by these electrolytes that we're developing, then we can continue to inject electrons and continue to hydrogenate these intermediates to make you know, alcohols or methanol, ethanol, and so on. Uh, you mentioned electrolytes there, and that was another one that I was kind of curious about because you mostly hear about electrolytes in your, like, sports drinks. And I'm wondering what are electrolytes in the electrochemistry process? So the typical electrolyte would be exactly like Gatorade, you know, something that has a water base and some uh, supporting salt in, in the water. Um that's great. That's actually water is, uh, you know, um, a benign solvent in this case, but it's just not stable enough, especially for electrochemically converting carbon dioxide, because carbon dioxide is a very unreactive molecule, right? It's flat and it's really hard to activate it for reactions. And um, before you activate it, meaning, you know, we, we apply, um, driving force, like a potential to, to activate carbon dioxide. Before we can activate carbon dioxide, we activate water <laughs> and it starts to break down. So um, we need to think about other electrolytes that are stable enough that we um, only break down CO2 or we you know, hydrogenate or make a CC type of coupling reactions so that we get higher value products. 
And so this is where HBox come in. Uh, I introduced HBox as, you know, having organic ions and hydrogen bonding, you know, uh, components. And so they are by default electrolytes because they have ions and they have, you know, this um, solvent. The good thing is these, um, because of these specific interactions among the constituents of HBox, they're not as volatile, right? So, um, so that is, I would say, a type of electrolyte that is um, kind of unconventional. Special thanks to Berju Gurkhan for the Discovery Files I'm Nate Podcast. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at nsf.gov.